Well, good afternoon and welcome to Bayview. What a beautiful day to be under the tent and think of where we were a year ago. So, uh, there's a nice crowd here. And uh, it kind of kicks off our summer season here and we think it's a really important forum to have to talk about affordable housing in Emmett County. And uh, our theme this year at Bayview is there's no place like home. And I think listening to Faith preach last Sunday and her lectures this week, what you find out is there's more to a house, it becomes a home. And that's important for people to have, no matter your income level or who you are. And Faith has the example of what we need to do here in some ways. So thank you, Faith, for being here. She, Faith, please stand up. She's the uh, United Methodist Church in Detroit and the executive director of the Cass Community Foundation and her tiny homes project is uh, known worldwide as we're finding out and uh, you're doing a wonderful job of helping people who don't have houses so thank you so a couple announcements first of all we're under a tent but you know what Bayview does have bathrooms <laughs> now, back in the 1800s, we found that a tent was here, but there weren't bathrooms at that point. But the restrooms are two buildings back of you and to the right, underneath the administration building. So that's where you need to go for the restrooms. And there's running water in Bayview. A couple other quick announcements. Um, we have a full schedule of summer activities this year, which is so good to hear from last year. And back on the table, you'll see our calendar of events that outlines all the different activities, the educational classes, the rec program uh, classes, and musicals. So please take one and come back. Bayview is an open community to everyone in this community, and we welcome you to Bayview. Secondly, I'd be remiss, wouldn't I, Greg Jackson and Mary Jackson, if I didn't mention the 17th annual Little Travis Crop Walk is a week from Saturday, June 26th. We start two buildings up at Evelyn Hall at 8.30 with registration. We do a three-mile walk around the campus so you can see the buildings, the homes, the shore of the line. And what we're doing there is raising money to help feed the hungry in Emma County and around the world through Church World Services. So please come and support our crop walk. It's, it's a great event, and we have Scoops ice cream for anybody who walks afterwards. So there's, there's a highlight for you. What about those who rock? Yes. Bob is a rocker, and we have rocking chairs. And he rocks every rock he gets, he gives a dollar. <laughs> ice cream. And you get two ice creams. So, yeah, please come support the crop walk. It's one of the biggest crop walks in the state of Michigan, and uh, we do a lot of good for uh, Manna, Brother Dan's Pantry here in Petoskey, and the Harbor Springs Food Pantry. So it's a really great event. Finally, I'd like to introduce a few Bayview people that I think are here. I know Mike Spencer's in somewhere back, back in the back. He's our executive director. Give Mike a hand. days a year even when the cottages are shuttered up and there's not a thing going on here he's working hard our board of trustees president Carol Nethercutt is here stand up and say hello. <laughs> she gives you more things than you even want to know about <laughs> and then finally um, I'd like to introduce Jeannie Greer our educational director she's the one who puts together the idea of this forum came up she said let's put it under the educational category and this really kicks off our summer season of educational classes thank you Jeannie for taking that on and being part of the Bayview education program appreciate it so with that I'm going to turn over I think that's all my announcements it is I'm going to turn it over to Scott Smith and he'll introduce our great panel for today thanks for coming Thank you, Jeannie, and 
thank you, Bayview community, for uh, for hosting this event and for kicking off uh, this year's program uh, with a topic that, unfortunately, is very, very critical uh, for the development of our region, as it is in many areas uh, throughout the country. Uh, I'm going to give a quick overview, a quick introduction of our panelists. We have a great panel here today to talk to you about a lot of things that are going on and a lot of things we'd like to have go on. Um, and then give you a quick overview of our program and then turn it over to my colleagues for you to, to give different aspects of the, of the issue. Um, so our panelists are Mary Catherine Hanna, who's uh, here on my left. Uh, she's the executive director of Perry Farm Village and the Village of Hillside in Harbor Springs. Nikki uh, Devitt, who's the president of the Petoskey Regional Chamber of Commerce. Jane McKenzie, who is the executive director of Northern Homes Community Development Corporation. Sarah Yorick, the executive director of Northwest Michigan Habitat for Humanity. And the other Sarah, Sarah Ford, uh, director of community philanthropy at the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation. And I'm Scott Smith. Um, and together with all of the rest of us, we are all part of a group called the Little Traverse Bay Housing Partnership, which came together about four years ago to try to focus attention on this issue. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the program. We want to start with a kind of definition of what is the issue and why does it exist that Mary Catherine is going to lead. There are some copies of handouts that we'll, um, she will kind of talk from. If you haven't picked up one of those or have one of those, I think there's some over on the table there. You may want to follow along or pick them up later. Uh, after Mary Catherine speaks, uh, Nikki is going to talk a little bit about the economic impact this is having on our economy, on our businesses, on our workforce. And then we're going to look at three different examples of ways that this, this issue is being addressed in our community. Uh, first, from Northern Homes and from Jane. Second, Habitat for Humanity from Sarah. And third, from the Petoskey uh, Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation and a fund that has been set up there a year or so ago, a year and a half ago now, I guess, uh, called the Emmett Housing Solutions Fund. Uh, and then I will kind of give a few little words about the, the part housing partnership. We have a couple of, of questions that we want to put in a, a panel discussion to the members of this group and then uh, turn over to answer your questions and, and um, respond to those. So, tight pack program, we will try to, uh, to move along quickly as possible and hopefully find a lot of time to be able to respond to the questions you may have and to, um, to answer some of those um, in a way that um, gives you some idea, of, better idea of what's happening in the community and how you can help. So with that, let me hand over to Mary Catherine who's going to introduce the issue. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to set a timer here so that I am very conscious of my companions and what they have to say because I could talk for a very long time on this topic, as can many of the folks that were up here. Um, so just by way of quick introduction, um, yes, I am the executive director for Perry Farm Village in the Village of Hillside. We're part of Presbyterian Villages of Michigan, which is a statewide senior housing and senior services nonprofit. We have 36 campuses throughout the state of Michigan. And I will tell you that originally I came to this issue more as an employer, um, because as we'll talk about a little bit, I was starting to see issues four, five, six years ago in terms of being able to recruit staff to work for me because they couldn't find housing. And these are people who are making you know, pretty decent salaries. Um, so I think everyone up here was part of the original group that four or five years got together and said, we need to do something about housing. And I think all of us kind of naively assumed that we would get into a room, we'd get some smart people together and be like, we got this, we'll get it taken care of, we'll get some housing built, no problems. So here we are five years later. Um, there are a lot of things that go into why housing is an issue and why it's really important that we are talking about it and dealing with it and dealing it with it at all levels, right? Dealing with it as community members, as units of government, as philanthropists, as developers, as um, nonprofit organizations, because it's going to take all of us around the table to solve this. So it seems pretty obvious to talk about why housing is really important. We've got to attract local workforce, we've got to attract employers, we've got to attract young people and families. I don't know if any of you saw the article in the Harbor Springs paper about the fact that they're going to shut down one of the school buildings there because school enrollments are so small. Um, and that's because we don't have young people who are either staying in the community up here or moving up here because they can't find starter homes. That's a big problem for us. 
So why, why isn't this happening? Why isn't housing being built if we tell you that there is such a huge demand for it? There are a lot of barriers that get in the way. Construction costs. If any of you've checked this out lately, three hundred dollars a square foot, and that's not that's that's before you've bought land. If you have to buy land and put in infrastructure, you're probably cost talking close to five hundred dollars a square foot. So there is no way that you can build new at an affordable level for people in the county. High cost of property, we all know that, right? Good for us who are homeowners or landowners up here, but property costs property costs are really high. High costs or lack of infrastructure. For good, bad, or ill, we're a rural county. There's the south in me coming out. We're a rural county. Um, so that's a problem when you talk about infrastructure, when you talk about water hookups, sewer hookups, electricity. And then you can talk about some things that we've come to think of as infrastructure, like broadband. Right? If we're going to attract people to work up here in the new economy, and broadband has to be a part of that discussion. Labor shortages in trades. They either left or they aren't here at the moment, which is an issue. Zoning restrictions. This is where units of government come into play. Zoning restrictions and building codes. These have changed dramatically over the past 50 years. And you think about what our communities used to look like and what they look like now, very, very different. Um, but change is hard. So talking about how we shift some of these things is a huge challenge. One of the big issues up here, hot topic, long-term um, houses leaving the market for long, from long-term rentals to become short-term rentals of VBROs. And I know that's been in the news a lot, but it certainly is one of our big challenges up here. Um, the increase in the percentage of m homes that are on the second home market. And look, I am a product of this, right? I grew up coming up here in the summers. My parents owned property up in Goodhart. My grandfather got it in the 30s. I was a summer kid all the years that I was growing up. I live up here full time now because it's beautiful and I wanted to be here. But as we continue to see more and more of the homes become second homes, it leaves less room for the long term full time people up here to have homes. And the change in demographics. Right? We are an aging country, we are an aging state, we are an aging community. In my business, the senior services world, we talk about this area as a NARC, which is a naturally occurring retirement community. <laughs> See, because we like acronyms and we talk about those kinds of things, but it is true. But here's the flip side of that, right? And I certainly know it in my business. If you have an aging population, they need services. And who is going to provide those services for the people who, who want to summer up here, who want to vacation up here, who want to retire up here? So it's really critical that we start addressing this. So here's a question that we get a lot. What is affordable housing? And it, it gets kind of a, a not so great connotation sometimes when we talk about affordable housing. Affordable housing is simply housing that people can afford. I mean, there it is, right there, right? But what can people afford? So, Mostly when you talk in this business about what is affordable housing or what can people afford, you want to talk about 30% of household income. Or another way to think of that is 2.6 times your annual household income for, the, for your home price. But another statistic, and we have to think about this one a lot up here in a rural community, is household income plus transportation. Because in this community, you are driving to get to everything. You're driving to work, you're driving to your groceries, you're driving to school, you're driving to get services. So another statistic that's talked about is 45% of your household, no more than 45% of your household income should be spent on housing plus transportation. All right. This is a lot of statistics, which is why we gave you a handout. I don't want you to have to be taking notes. I know this is an educational seminar, but I didn't want you to have to take notes. So we're giving you these to take away with you. But they're really important to think about in terms of what is this issue and how can we start to address it. So if you look at Emmett County, 92% of our workforce is over that 45% number. 92%. I have people who work at Perry Farm Village who are driving from Boyne to come work for me. Okay, that's one car issue away from not being able to make a shift, which then cascades down and is a whole other story that you wouldn't even want to hear about. But that's an issue if we have that people are driving all the way from Boyne in order to be able to have affordable housing so that they can work. So in our county, and we put some of these in here, I think it's really interesting to really focus on what does that mean? So in Emmett County, the average income for somebody who's up here full time is about $60,000, give or take. Go look at household size, it's around in there. Which means that based on that 30% number, you're talking about a household price of about $180,000. 
think about that for a minute. Where in Emmett County right now can you buy a house for $180,000 that doesn't have dirt floors? Yeah. <laughs> and those places exist, don't get me wrong. <laughs> So this is really critical to think about. When we think about the housing crisis, we're not talking about people who aren't working. We're not talking about truly subsidized housing. A lot of what we're talking about is what we refer to as the Alice population, which is asset limited income constraint. It means they are working, usually full time, sometimes two or three jobs, but they still cannot afford a house and they cannot afford the cost of living. And I will tell you right now between Harbor and Potosky, that number is up over 50%, which is kind of scary to think about in terms of economic development and the sustainability of our community. So again, this is a really critical issue to be working on. So you might glance at this, and this table is in your handouts, at some of the median incomes and what that looks like for affordability, and I think that's a really great statistic and that's really great data to keep in your mind as you're thinking about this going forward and who we're really talking about in terms of affordable housing and what we need. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. One of the big things that the, our group worked on in conjunction with um, some area, some regional groups is um, a market study to see, all right, what, what are we really talking about here in terms of need? And it was a little disheartening, I will say, when we got the study back because the numbers are kind of obscene. They're really big. 1,800 rental units needed. 1,800 rental units needed in our community. Think about that for a minute. Um, and over well over 500, 450, 500 units of homes that would be owned by somebody. And if you think about the number of housing permits that are issued in terms of building, it was great, right? We all remember that, or a lot of us do. It was up, 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 it was really great, it was really great, and then boom, crash, done. And they've come back a little bit, but not nearly to the level that we need them to be. To be replacing the house stock that we have lost, let alone putting up new housing that's desperately needed. And it's all kinds of housing. I mean, I think that's the other thing we didn't really think about when we first started this discussion, is the housing is needed at all levels. Yes, it's needed at the very bottom, it's needed at the true subsidized um, level, but it's needed in the middle range, and it's needed at the high end. I mean, we all know every builder up here is busy right now. Like, busy, like, won't even return your phone call busy. <laughs> and they are not building, unfortunately, at the low end, because that's not where their margins are. And I don't blame them a bit, right? Make sun, make hay while the sun shines. I'll get it. Make, make hay while the sun shines. Um, that's great for them, and that's really wonderful. It shows that there continues to be a demand at that high end of our market, but we desperately need housing in the middle and the lower ends of our working population. So the 2020 projected rental demand is only 650 bucks a month. Again, ask me where in Emmett County you can rent something for $650 a month. And I got a bridge I want to sell you. Um, this is really tough. This is a really tough thing to think about. Um, <clears throat> there is some you know, room at the higher end of the $1,000 and $1,000 plus a month, but even there, there's not a lot that is available and there's a lot of demand that's needed. You know, one of the things that we've heard about from uh, area employers is people who are employing at the middle and upper end are not able to recruit because people can't afford houses who are coming in here. And we're not, we're, this, is, this is like double the median area income that we're talking about in terms of pay ranges. Um, and they still can't afford it. So our communities need a variety of houses and a variety of house uh, price points um, to purchase in order to solve this. Um, unfortunately, it's gonna be something where we are all gonna have to work together in order to fix it. This is something where we are gonna need community support. We are gonna need our elected officials. We're gonna need our units of government. We're gonna need our planners. We're gonna need um, our agencies involved in this at every level in order to fix it. And I think the other thing that it's hard for us to remember, and I've been in a couple development projects now, so I know this is a long timeline. We start now, we'll probably see some units in five years. But we have, this is, we just have to start working on it because otherwise it's never gonna happen. Um, so I kind of want to leave it there because that's a lot of information to throw at you. But one of the other slides I really want to draw your attention to is there are a couple of things in the back that talk about middle market or missing middle housing. And that's kind of what we have been trying to put our focus on is the kind of housing that used to exist all over and kind of doesn't anymore for a variety of reasons, this missing middle. Um, and there are a lot of examples in there of what missing middle housing looks like. It's not nearly as scary as if we're talking about throwing up a 200 unit apartment building. <laughs> 
and it's something that we can really have a lot of control over in our communities to make sure that it's the right housing for us. So I am now going to pass the mic along. Who do I pass it to next? Well, just quickly, um, I just want to ask Nikki here. Um, so from, well, you can get up if you want, or you can talk right here. So um, what's the economic impact of this on our workforce, and how is it affecting our area businesses? I mean, I'm going to set my timer as well because I am a long talker. So you look at it from the standpoint of what you know. What Mary Catherine was saying, there were some core things there. And when you look at the statistics of the people in our county who are struggling to find housing, any housing, the house that they can afford, it all comes back to how does that affect your local business? How does that affect your economy? And I love it when people ask me. Um, the nation is having a workforce issue, you're having a workforce issue, I hear you did a job fair and four people showed up, where's the problem? Housing. I hear you have a transportation problem, why is that a problem? Housing. Well, I hear that there's child care issues, housing, and all of those things come back to our employers because what our employers are looking at, what our businesses are saying to us every single day is, I can't find someone to work, or I can find someone to work, but they don't have the housing or the transportation they need to get back and forth because they're living so far away because they can't live here. People want to work and live in the same place. They want to be a part of their community. They don't want to have them in a situation where they're concerned if their employees are gonna make it to work because they're traveling so far. Or a lot of situations we're starting to hear is, I have a fantastic opening for a really great professional position and I can't hire it right now. So my productivity changes, my hours now have to change, my operation changes. So our businesses are now faced with decisions that are pretty insurmountable beforehand, but COVID has exacerbated this to an incredible level. And that is, if I can't operate fully because I don't have the key workforce I need, what cuts do I need to make? Or how do I raise my prices? How does that affect my community, my economy? What does that look like so that I can keep my business in the sense that it was prior to a pandemic or prior to all of these things coming at once? And as Mary Catherine pointed out, um, you start now, you see things in five years. When we started five years ago, we really thought we'd see things by now, but there are hurdles and it's not just construction. It is also the perception of housing. And you know, well, we're a quaint little town or we're a quaint little community, we don't need that. Actually, you do. Our average business in Emmett County is tourism, especially in your Petoskey focus. When you look right in your downtowns and your communities, Petoskey and Harbor, you're focusing on tourism, service industry. Who works for service industry? And where are they living? And can they afford it? $650 is the number that Mary Catherine pointed out. I have employers who are doing stipends to help employees find ways to support their housing needs. Or saying, calling us and saying, I just had an employee whose long-term rental that they've been renting for three years is now gonna to convert to a short-term rental and they don't have a place to live. Where do I put them? I don't have that answer because we don't have that. So from the Chamber's perspective, we look at it as this is the critical issue that affects all the other issues that drive an economy. And when you ignore those issues or you think I'll fix this one first and this one next, what ends up happening is you're five years down the road and nothing has changed and now your workforce is leaving. Your community looks different. It functions differently because it doesn't have the same base year round to make it grow and thrive on an economic level. And we don't wanna see that. We want to be able to give people that opportunity to live and work and recreate and enjoy everything all in one, but we realize that it takes everything. And housing is the one that everything kind of comes back to. Um, you can start to address that childcare and that's gonna help an employer retain that employee or maybe even flexible hours with them. You can start to address you know, the issues of transportation and that's gonna help. But it all comes back to where do they live? Where is their home? Because you know, as you said, this is home for you. And we love that Bayview is home for you. And we just know that the importance of finding home for all of our community is vital to the continuation of the economy that we know and that we're used to. You won't see it today, but you'll see it coming in the years to come if we don't take that action now. So uh, we just wanna make sure that groups and wonderful people like you're gonna hear from continue to get the support they need and the voice they need so that everybody understands the importance of housing. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Um, 
So this is all very sobering, a lot of numbers, a lot of uh, sort of doom and gloom in a sense, but um, don't want to leave you with that impression. And so there are actually things that are happening. Uh, so we want to highlight a few of those uh, right now. Uh, first with Jane and Sarah and Sarah. We're going to talk about some of the other th things that are going on. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about the Little Traverse State Housing Partnership and what we're trying to do to kind of focus attention on this. Mary Catherine mentioned that a little bit at the outset, but um, just to focus a little bit more on sort of the priorities that have been defined by the partnership and, and where we, uh, well, progress that we've seen, but also where we're going. So, Jane. Thank you, Scott. I'm Jane McKenzie with Northern Homes Community Development Corporation. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that develops affordable housing. We're based in Boyne City, but we cover a six county area in Northern Michigan, including Emmett County. Uh, we have three main programs. Um, our first one is we do home buyer education. We are a HUD housing counseling agency with HUD certified counselors. So we do home buyer education. Um, we also do the step before that, which is just basic financial education, helping people set budgets and set goals. And then we do the home buyer education class. We also do um, foreclosure prevention services. So when people do hit a bump in the road, like their car breaks down and they lose their job, um, you know, how do you get over that? How do you work with your lender so that you can get back on an even keel and move forward? Um, the second program we have is we do own some apartments here in Petoskey. We own and develop apartments, but they were built about um, 15 years ago, and the program that they were built under is no longer available to build apartments in rural areas. But we're really fortunate that we do have that affordable housing asset in the Petoskey community. It's Maple Village Apartments, it's 97 apartments, and they rent um, from 390 to 785 a month. So they're two and three bedroom apartments, and um, they stay full all the time. So for probably the last five years, we've been at or near 100% occupancy at those apartments. So in order to be able to move in there, you've got to be just real lucky and hit it at the right time when somebody is moving out. Um, typically for a community you want to see um, you know 5% vacancy or something like that just so that you have the apartments available for when people need them but we definitely don't have that here in this community um, the third program that we do is we um, build in and rehab single-family houses last year we sold a house here in, in town um, that was affordable to a family earning less than 80% of the area median income that was a program that was available through the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. And again, those funds are no longer available to rural communities. They've decided that they want to use those funds to support their multifamily housing program, so they're no longer available for single family houses. And their multifamily housing program is more for urban areas and not for rural areas. So, um, you know, we continue to look for other programs and other ways to develop housing locally using local funds. And so there's a couple of ways that we're looking at doing that. One is working with um, the local land banks authorities and um, the local brownfield authorities to kind of create local housing funds. Um, but that's something that's really just in the beginning of the um, process, and um, but something that we hope will become a bigger source of funds in the future. Um, and that's all I have. So now it's Sarah. Just jump right in, all right. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Gilrick. I'm the Executive Director at Northwest Michigan Habitat for Humanity. We are an affiliate of Habitat International and we serve Emmett and Charlevoix counties. Um, our two uh, programs that we have, first we construct and sell homes to low to moderate income households. And then uh, another program that we have that less people um, are familiar with is a home repair program. So we also assist current homeowners uh, make repairs um, in aging housing, uh, at, you know, also again focusing on people that are low to moderate income. Um, so today I wanted to kind of focus on just a few strategies we've been using recently to overcome some of the barriers that Mary Catherine um, described to you. And uh, the first strategy we've been using is kind of shifting to using modular-based construction. Um, 
we've been investigating this for the last couple of years, uh, really did our homework and decided to work with a company. It's a Michigan-based company out of Bay City. Uh, we worked with them one-on-one -on -one to help us develop our housing plans so that they met our quality standards and efficiency standards. Um, and we're really excited to kick off three of those projects this year. We're just about ready to wrap up all three of those homes and sell them to our program partners. The reason that we started looking at using modular construction, um, it really just comes down to how do we grow our capacity as an organization to uh, more quickly address this housing crisis. In the past, um, we've been able to build homes, you know, site-built, stick-built homes, about 12 to 18 months is what it was taking us to construct those homes using volunteer labor. So we just really needed to find a resource that would help us overcome that, that time constraint. Um, so modular housing really allows us to do that. We found that we've been able to fully develop these homes in a, in a six month or less time frame, which is amazing. Um, not only does you know, it help us you know, produce housing uh, more quickly, but it also reduces costs because we don't have that overhead cost from sustaining our programs and our staffing you know, for the 12 to 18 months that it was taking us to build. So really beneficial there. Um, another uh, reason that modulars can be great for Northern Michigan especially is because our short you know, building window, we have winter that likes to disrupt a lot of our plans, so that, that's helpful there as well. Um, it's also less burden on our staff. We're a small uh, you know, grassroots organization. We don't have a huge staff. We don't have a huge construction department, so it really takes off some of the weight off of our staffing and our, and our volunteers as well. Um, modular construction has also helped us as far as budgeting and planning goes because when over half of your costs are kind of fixed, you know what it's going to cost to purchase this housing unit. It really helps us, helps us with long-term uh, planning. Um, so and another strategy I just kind of wanted to talk about is partnerships and collaborations. So you'll see we've got many uh, representatives of organizations here at the table that have come together to try to work on this issue. Um, you know, I have a long, long list of people that help us get this work done, but I really wanted to kind of highlight three partners that have helped us significantly over the last year in our development. The first is the Emmett County Land Bank. Um, we received a donation of property from the land bank a couple of years ago. It's four contiguous lots that have um, we've been developing and working on over the last couple of years. They're actually where some of our new modular units are located. And so that's been really instrumental in helping us overcome the, uh, the gap, the cost to, to develop affordable homes. So just opportunities like that really help nonprofits and developers to make these projects possible. Um, I also wanted to highlight our work with the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation. Not only do they support us just through their annual grant cycles, um, they also have their Housing Solutions Fund, which I know Sarah plans to, to speak with you more um, about. Um, but we also were a recipient of their first ever um, PRI, their Program Related Investment, which was really great for us this past year. Uh, fundraising was difficult. I mean, we were in the middle of a pandemic, so it wasn't it wasn't really easy to do. And what this program allowed us to do was to borrow one hundred and twenty thousand dollars with zero percent interest, so we could use that that money to develop an extra home this past year. So otherwise, um, you know, that that's one less home that would have been built this past year. So we're really grateful for that support. And then I always like to highlight our work with the Pelston High School Trades Program. It's a really great collaboration with the school. Um, we try to build a home with them every year. You know, COVID kind of interrupted some of those plans. Um, but in the future, we plan to move forward with, with, with that strategy. And so what we do is we build a, a site-built, stick-built home with the school. The students provide the volunteer labor. We provide all of the materials and the land to develop the home. And it results in an additional home being built. And it also invests in future um, you know, trades professionals for our community. So really great opportunity there. Um, and then, so the last thing I just want to talk about is our focus over the last few years has really, like I said, been growing our capacity and doing more and how we can be um, more aggressive in responding to the housing crisis. So we kind of sat down and came up with a plan. It's a pretty aggressive plan, but I'm very excited. You're kind of the first crowd that's hearing about this plan. Um, we're, uh, we had a, a, a donor, the St. Doris Foundation in Harbor Springs approached us and um, they actually donated funds for us to acquire 32 lots 
in a partially developed subdivision in Alanson. So we're very excited. Um, it's created a great opportunity. And so that property, in addition to uh, several of the other lots that we already kind of had in our portfolio, we sat down and we're like, okay, how do we, how do, we do all of this? I want to do all of it, because that's just the way I operate. Um, <laughs> so what we did was we came up with a, a plan, and we're going to be rolling out a, a capital campaign to raise just under $4 million to help us do just that, to build 42 single-family homes over the next four years. So we're very, very excited about this plan. Um, and kind of the cherry on top of it all is that we have um, already had committed support in a challenge grant that we will have uh, challenge grant support, one-to-one uh, -one matches of all donations supporting our campaign up to $1 million. So just really, really exciting and incredible. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, like I said, this is kind of a sneak peek because we haven't gone public with our campaign, but I thought this would be a great opportunity to just get this information out to everyone here today. So there are some uh, brochures about our campaign on the table, and uh, anybody that's interested in being involved, whether it's making a financial contribution or maybe volunteering to help with our, our fundraising efforts, I'd really love to hear from you. So, thank you. Now I get to hear from the other Sarah, and we strategically seated ourselves at the opposite ends of the table, so when questions come, there's no confusion. Because um, a while ago in the housing partnership, we had a third Sarah, so that got really interesting. In a, a group of six, we'd have three of us named Sarah. So, but side note: when I was in first grade, I was in the class of three people, and two of us were named Sarah. So it's been a lifelong struggle for me. <laughs> Um, so I, I am Sarah Ford and I'm with the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation and we have been a member of the Little Traverse Bay Housing Partnership since very early days, maybe not as, as long as Mary Catherine and Scott and some others, but um, very early on. Um, several years ago, you know, we, I, I attend a lot of community meetings um, and try and really keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening in our community. And um, several years ago, we just continued to hear housing, 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 as, as Nikki was saying, came up as um, a barrier to a lot of things that were happening in our community. And so our board identified housing as one of our strategic initiatives. I keep saying it's like two years ago, but I think it's probably like four now. Um, time has really uh, passed. But so we, our board made a commitment to, to um, being a part of the housing solution. And um, through that, we've done a lot of a lot of different. We, our board, made a commitment to to um, being a part of the housing solution. And um, through that, we've done a lot of a lot of different things. Um, we've long supported housing efforts through our general grant making, um, through our two responsive grant cycles every year. Uh, as Sarah said, we've supported organizations like Habitat and others, Northern Homes and others that are are creating housing in our community. Um, but as we, as the Little Traverse Bay Housing Partnership, began to look at what action steps we could take um, as a partnership, we quickly identified funding as a need. Um, we looked at why projects weren't happening, and funding gaps became very clear um, as, as an issue, that no matter if you got the price of materials down or got certain developers to you know um, volunteer labor or things like that that there was just there was just going to continue to be this funding gap part of that is um, because as jane was saying we're a rural community that doesn't have access to a lot of the state and federal um, housing funding programs that exist for some of our um, larger communities so there's there's not that resource available um, but some of it is the the cost of land um, as materials have gone up there's a lot of reasons for the funding gap but um, as we would look with some of our developer friends um, they would run some what call what are called pro formas where you can look at um, you know how much money you're going to need in order to make a housing um, project fun uh, affordable there was always this huge gap so um, we started talking and we thought, okay, well, what can we do to address this? And um, we've, we've decided to create the Emmett Housing Solutions Fund. Our partners at the Fry Foundation provided a very generous seed grant to get that started. And then our board um, uh, opted to put some of our own assets into that uh, fund to, to bring it up to you know a, an initial level. And the Emmett Housing Solutions Fund is a fund that is um, was created to 
focus on what we are calling kind of the pre-development stage. That's where we identify the, the gap, that there's um, developers don't want to take a risk to maybe do an environmental study on a piece of property or um, land needs to be acquired so that a project can um, move forward. Um, other um, things like um, going to the zoning and going through all of that work that needs to be done to get a project um, approved. Those things all cost money and are a barrier to people, um, you know, moving forward with a project. So the pre the Emma Housing Solutions Fund um, focuses on that, that pre-development stage, um, including land acquisition. Um, we were able to, um, or infrastructure development, things like that, that could cost additional money. Um, one example, the first grant was made from that fund last year to Habitat. Habitat, you'll see here as a theme, is a very strong partner of ours, and we're proud to support them. Um, so on those lots in Odin, where Sarah was creating these modular constructed homes, they need, had some need for some wells, because as we talked about earlier, infrastructure is an issue in rural communities. We don't have sewer and water in all of our communities. So um, we provided a, a smaller grant in order for Sarah to be able to do some well construction on those properties. Um, now we're looking at, um, could this fund be used to help acquire land so that we could move forward with um, a project? So the Emmett Housing Solutions Fund is again one piece of the fund um, funding solution. Um, you know, in order for it to be the only solution, we would really literally need to raise millions and millions and millions of dollars. But um, our goal is for it to be a part of the solution, and we hope that by p being a piece of the solution, we can um, leverage some of our other resources and come together um, with some other partners, the local units of government perhaps, or the um, maybe we can find some other um, funding sources from other uh, grant funding. But those are all things that need to come together in what's called the capital stack so that we can make these projects happen. Um, the Emmett Housing Solutions Fund was started in December of 2019. Um, and we um, have raised just about $200,000 for it um, so far, um, and we're hoping to raise $500,000 by, um, actually by the end of next year was our initial goal. Um, and so that's just one way that you could um, support something if you're looking to support things. Um, and um, I think that it's a really uh, great example of how we can use philanthropy um, to to play a role in this. Uh, we've, we've talked about partnerships and I think that the only way that we're going to um, help solve this problem is through um, those public-private community partnerships and the Community Foundation is proud to be a part of that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott and he's going to talk about the Little Traverse Bay Housing Partnership. Right, so as, as Sarah just mentioned and as everybody has mentioned, the only way that we're gonna get a handle on this and, and get to some solutions is by working together through partnerships. It takes public partners, it takes private partners, it takes everyone kind of contributing to this effort. So with that in mind, uh, a, a small group of us, it's now grown a little bit more, uh, got together uh, several years ago uh, to see what we could do to bring that community together, to try to bring together all of the members of the community of, that relates to housing. So builders and finance organizations and realtors and developers and property owners and nonprofit organizations, everyone that touches the housing issue in some way to see if together we can uh, solve this problem or at least reach towards some solutions that we aren't able to do individually. So the Petoskey Chamber of Commerce, uh, Presbyterian Villages, uh, Mary Catherine and Harbor Inc. Um, we're kind of the initial founders. Uh, we met for the first two times at the bowling alley <laughs> in the afternoons, kind of brainstormed a little bit of how we could move forward with this. And we've now expanded. We're not an official organization yet, but we have expanded into a larger group that meets monthly. Uh, we used to meet at the Community Foundation until COVID hit, and eventually we'll get back to an in-person meeting. Um, we have set kind of four uh, key targets or action areas. One is raising awareness in the community about the issue, um, events like this. Uh, we've had briefings, a number of service organizations and individual groups and others, just to, to acquaint people with the issue and, and what they can do about it. Policy has been mentioned as one of the key aspects of this, and so a second arm of our work has been to work with local planning commissions and local governments to try to look at ways that their zoning ordinances and other regulations may work against 
affordability and housing and look for ways that they can change those and bring other examples from other places to those discussions. A third area that, that Sarah touched on is looking for ways to bridge that financial gap. And how do we create local solutions that can partner with others, with state funding or other kinds of resources to try to put together some resources that will help to lower the cost for new development. And finally, and most critically, is how do we network, how do we build those relationships between all of the people it takes to get a project done? How do we contact the developers, the builders, the landowners, the others, and figure out what it takes in a specific place to do a specific project? And we've just begun that, and again, with help from the Community Foundation, the Fry Foundation, and others, we were able to hire last year a part-time program coordinator to do exactly that. The person who was in that position uh, had to leave. It's open right now, but we are now in the process of scaling that up to a full-time position with support from several local governments in this area. So the cities of Petoskey, Harbor Springs, Resort Township have committed to help work with us to help fund the position full-time and other local governments, other townships, we're working on discussing with them about that too. So I think we are about to uh, reach our sort of goal of, uh, of pulling together the full-time funding for that. We've got a, a very wonderful grant from a local giving circle just last week that really helped us um, move towards that goal line. And so we will be recruiting soon for another uh, full-time program coordinator to work with us on the ground. And I think that's what's going to take to, to put these things together. We've seen a lot of progress uh, in, the, in the four years or five years that we've been at this. Is that, I mean, there's a discussion. I think all of the local governments embrace and understand this. As a, there's more of a conversation about this, but we still have a long ways to go. But things are, are moving in a very positive direction, I think, as a result of the community's efforts in this area. I just want to mention that there are several other members of the, of the partnerships sort of in the audience here. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a group that uh, is, is becoming more and more engaged in specific projects and specific places. So that's kind of our sort of what we wanted to kind of broadcast to you. I know thank you for, for being patient and absorbing a lot of information. I thought we'd transition to a conversation here by having a couple of questions that I pose to the panel itself and then we'll sort of get to your questions too. So one of the questions we hear a lot when this topic comes up is, why doesn't the market just solve this problem? Why, why aren't builders building? Why, you know, why aren't landowners you know, uh, coming up with projects uh, to address this issue? There's a huge demand. You know, Catherine mentioned the numbers. So surely the market should address this. So let me ask the panelists, why isn't the market doing this? No, I, I mean, I think this, some of the statistics that we shared speak to a lot of this, right? I mean, it's about cost of construction, it's about the cost of land, but I think the more intangible answer is that it is also about um, the shifts in our community and what our community looks like and the shifts in demographics about who is moving where in the state and how those patterns are shifting a little bit. Um, I mean, the easy answer is to how do you keep housing affordable? How do you make it affordable? You build more of it. It's a supply and demand issue, right? If there was lots of housing, it would be less expensive to own the housing that exists out there. Um, but we have done a lot of education in taking this sort of dog and pony show out on the road over the winter to a lot of the different units of government and planning uh, groups and change is hard. And since the 70s, there has been there had been a real shift in how communities looked at themselves and how they planned for their development and where housing should be and what housing should look like and what kind of housing should be built. And shifting that is really scary to think about. But I like to talk about it, especially up here in this community, thinking about it as back to the future. Right? What did our communities look like in the 50s? What did they look like in the 40s? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day who still had an old Sears and Roebuck order through the catalog kind of home. Right? And that's, those were everywhere, and people owned them and loved them and <coughs> modified them over the years. Um, and so how can we make that um, interesting again and fun again to be at that level with that different type of housing? Um, you know, I, did, I grew up around Harbor Springs. I remember Harbor Springs when Mrs. Rosenthal's was downtown, and way before the Fila store came in in the 80s, that was, whoa. <laughs> um, 
But you think about what the community looked like then and what it could like it look like again, and that's what I like to think about. Which is a roundabout answer to how do you make housing affordable. So I'll let somebody else speak to the actual specifics because there are specifics. There are specifics, but and I'm going to let Jane do that. But what I wanted to mention too is you say you know uh, why doesn't the market fix fix the issue? And you said why do you know construction just go out and build all the homes? And we've talked about if you can make more money, why you know we get that. But also, I'm going to throw you back to now it's workforce again. Now we're back to the fact that. Even if you had every builder say, I will build 10 homes at a third of my cost so that I can affect this change. Oh, but wait, I'm sorry, I don't have the workers. Why don't you have the workers again? Oh yeah, because we don't have the housing for them. So I, I just find that circle very interesting. <laughs> There are, there are some programs that we are have been talking about and have been thinking about about how to keep things affordable. So one of the communities that we've been looking at, you guys might be aware of it, is Aspen. So Aspen, Pitkin County, they started working on this issue, oh my goodness, 40 years ago because they recognized that they were in a very similar position to us and other resort communities. Um, which is that they were quickly running out of affordable housing. Aspen, Pitkin County, of course, for those who've been there, is a valley. So they're a little geographically restricted. We don't have quite that issue. Um, but they started working on a couple of different programs. One is a deed restriction program. Um, and they were on the very early end of some of that. So that's a voluntary, actually in Aspen Pitt County it's not quite so voluntary in some of their programs, but it can be a voluntary program. So a deed restriction program is that you as the owner voluntarily put a restriction on your property such that, that then carries with the property so that it can only be purchased by somebody who meets certain restrictions. And you, know, and you could design those restrictions in lots of different ways. The ones that we've talked about have been, are, you know, do they live here full time? Are they employed in Emmett County? Or you can look at income restrictions. All of those would be available. Um, then there are some other programs um, around, like Jane, you've got some programs, I don't know if you want to talk about in terms of how you prevent that program. Yeah, so, and that's why you would have these programs. So if you do build something affordable, how do you keep it affordable for the long term? How do you keep it so that the person that purchased it affordably isn't going to turn around and sell it for this humongous profit because you put all of these um, subsidized sources, resources into it, you know, sold it at a lower, lower rate? How do you keep that and pass it on to the next homeowner? And the deed restriction is one way to do it. Another program that we do is called a community land trust. And that is where, as a nonprofit, we continue to own the land, but we sell the improvements. So the um, home buyer is purchasing the improvements and we own the land and then we enter into a 99 year ground lease with the home buyer. Um, the ground lease, so they have all the benefits of home ownership except they don't own the land. The um, ground lease has stipulations in it and that's what helps keep it, keeps it affordable for the long term. Ours have three main stipulations. One is the person that we sell it to typically earns less than 80% of the area median income. For all the ones we've sold so far, that was the restriction on them when they moved into the house. Now, after they live there, we don't ask for annual income verifications or anything like that. They just needed to meet that level when they moved in. So we're asking them, since we helped you at that level, when you go to sell the house, you need to sell it to a family that also earns less than 80% of the area median income when you sell the home. So that's one restriction. A second restriction is it does have to be your full-time year-round house. You can't move out of it for the summer and rent it as an Airbnb or move out of it permanently and rent it permanently. Um, so it has to be your, your principal place of residence. Our third restriction then talks about shared equity. So since they were able to purchase the home at a bargain, we want them to be able to pass that bargain on to the next person. So they don't get 100% of the increase in value of the house. In our restrictions, um, our ground leases, we say you get 22% of the increase in value. And the rest of that um, equity stays with the house to make it affordable for the next person that comes along. So they get 22% of the increase in value, plus they also get you know, the equity that you earn from paying down the principal on your mortgage. So when they go to sell the house, they get to use those funds to help them buy the next house. But this house then stays affordable in perpetuity. 
Um, so it's kind of complicated, but it is something that um, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Rural Development, kind of the major um, mortgage companies out there, recognize as a, a valid. So they have mortgage products for these. So it is something that you can get a standard mortgage for. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to expand. We have 15 of these now scattered throughout Charlevoix and Emmett County. Uh, that's something we're hoping to expand in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that was, the, the was, this was the second question because I mean, it often does come up, um, okay, I mean, you need some additional resources to help subsidize, uh, to use that word, to make something affordable. So how do you, how do you keep it affordable and keep it uh, from that initial homeowner kind of reaping the benefits of those subsidies? And so uh, there are a number of ways that are possible to do that. Uh, we're open to other ideas, but I think it's both looking for ways to kind of bridge that financial gap, but then keep those uh, those houses, those units, uh, affordable over the long term too. Renting rental houses is another way of doing that, and again, looking at various ways of keeping those rents low um, by again sharing the the um, the, um, the finances with the with the, the landowner who's renting those, those homes. So. Any other comments on, on either of those two questions? And if not, we can kind of turn it over to the audience. Well, I hope you are, are full of questions. So, Joe, yes. Uh, the uh, modular homes you're building now, um, how big are they, what's the configuration, and how much are they? Yeah, so uh, the homes that we've been building, we typically build right around 1,000 square feet. Um, our standard construction is a three bed, one bath house. Um, but we kind of look at our wait list for people that are looking to purchase homes for us and we might adjust the size based on household composition and, and build more rooms. But yeah, so the, the three that we built this year were um, uh, just about 1,000 square feet, three bed, one bath. Um, we're not yet at the point of sale, they're almost complete, and so we sell those at appraised value. So I, I can't really give you the sale price at this time, but we do sell them at appraised value. Um, because we think it's you know it's a part of our policy to to keep neighborhood values um, where they're at, but there's different ways uh, that Habitat helps homeowners to uh, make those sales affordable, and you know I can give more details if anybody has questions about that as well. But does that answer your question, Joe. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I'm just looking around and seeing what the well, I can see that most people here are probably retirement age and beyond. And um, we probably are owning our, living in our own home and are way past the idea of having to get a mortgage. Um, however, we probably have children, as we do, who have um, an issue with getting a mortgage. And while I'm not saying there is not an affordable housing issue. Okay, so it's definitely a crisis. But once you build this affordable housing, are people going to be able to get mortgages who have poor credit, who have no down payment, um, because of not working for a living wage, and um, that that's just a huge concern of mine. Um, I know there's a mortgage program. I don't know if it, I got the right letters, USDA or something like that. And, and a friend of mine in Boyd Falls um, has that mortgage. And she said she found out that after her 30 years of paying on that mortgage, she still won't own the house. So um, I don't know. I, I think you talked about that to some extent. but. That's my concern. Yeah, so we actually uh, work with people similar to what you're describing. So we're working with people um, that are at 30 to 80 percent of the area median income, so quite modest incomes. Um, so what we've been using lately is a USDA rural development uh, mortgage product, and that's been developed specifically for people that are in that income category. Um, so as far as credit is concerned, to be able to qualify for a mortgage product like that, you, you actually do have to have decent credit, um, not perfect, but you know, a, a decent credit score. 
So we typically work with uh, households that apply for our program well in advance if they're in a situation where they might have per credit or in Jane's case she also has um, you know, housing counseling and financial education classes as well. So we try to work with people over a longer term period to get them prepared to obtain a mortgage through credit counseling and, and services. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so we do finance some of our homes using a USDA, it's called a 502 loan. Um, in that they they offer the mortgage product. It is a interest bearing mortgage, but it's a subsidized interest rate. So our home buyers um, at the current market interest rate will obtain their mortgage, get approved, but then they subsidize that interest rate. So it kind of uh, will adjust based on the household's income to make sure that their mortgages are affordable. So that's one uh, option that is out there. But see, you end up not like what she said. Oh. I had I had one, and you end up not it like when it comes down to selling and stuff like that. You end up not getting. You end up having to pay all of that that back. So all that subsidy. So, so you're the, really not. You're really not. Uh, Going to, I'm not yeah, I mean, every program is a little bit different, and I'm not exactly sure, you know, what specific product that you might have had an experience with. Um, but you know, some of the other programs that we work with to help pay down the the payment. So, like I mentioned, we we sell our homes at appraised value. Well, then we also pair that home sale with additional uh, grants that are available out there through MISHTA, um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis, and there's there's several other opportunities out there. And so they will make a, a down payment um, basically on their behalf, but it is a grant that's forgivable over a certain period of you know time. Um, if the homeowner were to decide to sell their home, there is a portion of that uh, subsidy that they received on the front end that they would be responsible for paying back. But depending on what source of funding you're looking at, those could be fully forgivable, you know, over X amount of years. It just really depends on the, the different source of funding. You do raise a good, good point. I mean, one of the other sort of barriers has been um, kind of the mortgage uh, lending criteria. Um, we all know how a lot of financial institutions got burned in the, in the sort of 2006, 2008 period. And as a result of that, a lot of them pulled back and really tightened their procedures and made it more difficult for people to access mortgage funding. And, uh, from one way, that was um, it's a it was a sensible thing to do from a financial institution, but it really has had an impact. And as you say, um, you know, wages haven't been increasing, and so really that combination has been has been a, another barrier. Um, we have been sort of looking at ideas of working with the banking institutions. Um, a lot of the the banks, the larger banks especially, have funding that is available uh, you know, to give back to the communities in which they work. Uh, another idea that some of us have been kind of toying with is you know, are there ways to raise funds from, from local individuals, kind of an investment fund, and maybe pair those with the financial institution to help lower the costs, um, not so much on mortgage, but really more on the development costs. Um, so again, looking at how we can work with financial institutions uh, to help um, them uh, be, um, you know, be more of a player, more of a participant in helping uh, address and use affordability issues. So another question. Yes, sir. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, you all make quite clear that uh, the problem extends to the whole community, all the community. Almost everybody has a stake in this, which makes me want to ask you about local government involvement. In my home community, uh, uh, we have a mandate from my town uh, to support affordable housing. And the county actually manages a health as a housing office, and everybody contributes to that. And the government involvement seems to have at least three benefits. One is the, is the awareness. But another is it's so damn complicated. Um, yeah. And I'm so impressed yeah. with uh, the, the, the county uh, Housing officer, because because the this, the third thing you, you the, the, the subsidy the, the millage um, it isn't just spent by one project. It is leverage and leverage and leverage. If you talk about the match for this and the match for that um, to try to fit into some of these pretty obscure federal and state federal kind of kind of projects. So it seems to be a good opportunity to engage with the local governments, county, 
So, uh, so uh, let me go first. I mean, I've, this has sort of been something I've been involved in a fair bit. Um, so several things, actually. Um, one, of the, of the, um, the planning planners for the city of Petoskey and Emmett County are part of the housing partnership. So they're inside our circle, inside our group. And really, I think of that has really prompted a lot of review and, and proactive outreach to their respective planning commissions and, and county board, city council, uh, looking at the, the rules and regulations, the zoning ordinances and things like that. Um, Emmett County uh, Planning Commission has done a lot of work. They have signed up to something called the Housing Ready Checklist, which is something that our partner organization, Housing North, uh, has developed to really look at how communities can can adjust their policies to be more favorable to to um, to, to affordable housing. Um, City of Petoskey Planning Commission right now is sort of going through a very extensive process of looking at a whole long list of possible changes that they might make in their ordinances to make the city a more uh, friendly place for, for affordable housing. So I think the policy work is happening there. Um, a couple of us are on planning commissions. Mary Catherine and I are on our sort of respective planning commissions. Um, I'm also on the, the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and Sarah Ulrich is as well. Uh, so I think we are working with some of those entities. Uh, Sarah and, and Jane both mentioned the, the land bank. So there's a, been a lot of engagement with the land bank as well uh, on some of those issues. Um, at the Emmett County level, um, the county is planning, I think in late August, a special session for their board of commissioners to look at how the county might address this issue. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the county has created a couple years ago, maybe three years ago now, uh, an ad hoc economic development committee. I'm also on that committee. Um, and that uh, committee has developed a proposal, which uh, hopefully will be discussed at this August meeting of the county to create an Emmett County Housing Commission. Uh, that's not by any ways uh, a done deal, um, but it is something, a, a serious proposal, a lot of of research and effort has gone into that. The partnership has provided a lot of input, examples from other housing commissions elsewhere. And so if that were created, I think that could be a really central point in Emmett County uh, to really focus attention on that issue. So uh, if, if you are around in late August and uh, are able to attend uh, a session, uh, that session to kind of advocate for uh, an active county role in that, and in particular, um, the creation of a housing commission, I think that would that would really help our efforts here. But that, those are some of the things that, and I did mention that uh, we are also working with several of the local governments uh, to help fund uh, this uh, full-time coordinator position, and I think those efforts are, are moving ahead, and that will think, get them much more involved in the actual details of, of project by project activities. So. Um, no, and I think to uh, to Scott's point too, it's and it, to yours that you know that's a counting down, and there's you know tax base that's funding that. That's an awareness level, and I think that part of the partnership, the very first thing Scott mentioned, that the responsibility of the partnership is to show the awareness to all levels of our community, so that they understand the depth of housing and how it is affecting us all whether we have a wonderful home or whether we're renting and we're happy with it and you know live in a one bedroom apartment and we're great there everybody has a stakeholder in this and the um, Emmett County putting this in a special session in August is huge and and I think that we as a partnership are extremely excited for that to have a session dedicated to the issue of housing so to your point it does take everyone all partnerships together from a municipal level to a public and private level too so Stay in August and, and come say hi. <laughs> and oh, go ahead. No, no, it's, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to add, all of you can become our housing advocates. I mean, that's one of the pieces that, and why we think it's so important to be out in the community talking about this, is that then it's an opportunity for any of you at an event, at a cocktail party, at um, the grocery store, to talk to people about why this is really important, and then take the next step to talk to your local units of government about why this is really important and why these things have got to get addressed. Because as you know, you know our units of government and our elected officials are responsive to their constituents. And if they don't hear from people about this being a really important, critical issue that we address, 
they are not going to find it at the top of their to-do list because it is going to be a hard thing to do and it requires changes that are not easy for everybody so unless they are hearing from folks that we have got to address this it's not going to happen just on that note mary catherine on the table over there there was a hand page on a handout on what you could do and there are a number of things on there including talking to your local communities about um, efforts supporting housing that comes up for votes for zoning or um, variances those types of things um, there's a term nimbyism that you might have heard not in my backyard that's a real thing um, we're trying to get um, yimby yes in my backyard so the yes build housing for my community so those are things that you can do um, as well Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, at the county level, Emmett County, um, one of the, the actions that they took maybe last year was to reduce the minimum dwelling size from I think 720 to 560. So um, you know, it doesn't meet the this the definition of a tiny home, but certainly much smaller than what you typically see. Um, and Emmett County oversees the planning and zoning for a number of the townships in addition to. Um, yeah, they've done a number of things at the county level. Um, their planning and zoning has, has been really uh, leading the charge on trying to make some changes, as Scott was saying, to the the different regulations. Um, I don't know all the details, but I'm sure Scott does, because he's on all the committees. <laughs> uh, but one, one of the other things that is important there, too, is that uh, in most of our uh, zoning ordinances, there is not a minimum uh, residential size for multifamily developments. Um, and so one of the things that we're also discussing with a number of, of uh, planning commissions and others is looking at rezoning different areas for multifamily instead of single family. And so that gives more options for development. Obviously, if you can build four units on a, on a parcel than, rather than one, then you can cut down your cost per unit. Uh, but also smaller sizes, you know, Catherine mentioned some of the demographic changes. Whether that's because of uh, people who are aging and maybe uh, have only one or two people in their household or young people starting out, there are a lot of one person households. I think, I think I mean, a majority of the households in Emma County are two people or less right now. And so, but the, but the housing stock doesn't, doesn't correspond to that. The housing stock is a lot of larger single family homes. And so part of that is to adjust what's developed to be more of those multifamily, smaller units, uh, walkable in, in cities where that's possible. Uh, and so um, those kinds of things also can, can you know, be more compact than is often the case on, on single family work. And I think that's really critical in talking about the demographic changes is making sure that we are developing the right thing for the next generation of homeowners or people who are living here or living in our area. Um, because as Scott noted, you know, those demographics the households are shrinking, they have been shrinking for quite some time. And if we think about who is here and who we want to be here, um, I think that is gonna be so important as we look ahead. And how can, is there then an interesting way to redevelop the housing stock that we have in order to address these different housing needs? One of the solutions we came to here in Bayview was to split one of the cottages between the, the resident director of worship and the visiting minister took one cottage made two units. If you take some of the large, empty old houses in the area and sort of divide them up less expensively than tear it down and rebuild it. I think there are a lot of opportunities in that direction. What you're going to run into is zoning, right? In the 70s, we fell in love with single family, single home zoning. And it exists everywhere to the detriment of every other type of housing. 
Um, and so I think that's something that we will have to address moving forward. But yes, there are there's so especially in the senior services world, there are so many cool things that people are doing. Co-op housing, shared housing, um, you know, younger family, older person who needs care housing. There's I'm, all sorts of cool things that are happening, but definitely have to address them. Um, I don't know if some of you were in Harbor Springs a little over a year ago when there was a giant issue about uh, co-housing in a certain neighborhood. And I wanted to say it's existed for a very long time. Walk down to the to the shore. There are two giant rooming houses have been there forever. They serve the little Harbor Club. So let's get over ourselves. Um, but I think this is also, so if you look, flip through in our communities already, and you'll see those are mostly focused on new houses. But part of the challenge is looking at how to use existing housing stock and maybe converting, as you say, a larger house into, you know, two or three units. And that does happen. I mean, if you, you look around certain neighborhoods in Petoskey, there are built, there are old houses that look from the street to be a house and fit into the neighborhood, but they actually house several people. Look at how many mailboxes there are, or electrical connections there are. To Mary Catherine's point too as well, um, you had mentioned that we have to build for demographics. We have to build for who's here and who we want here. As a Chamber of Commerce, our number one thing is business. And our businesses, they want two things. They want talent attraction, but more to the point, talent retention. They want to make sure that the people we have here and the youth we have growing up that are going to incredible trades programs or doing apprenticeships now because our businesses see that value that it's not always about a four-year degree. It's about taking the kids we have and getting them the certificates they need to build our future workforce. But they say, where do we put them? So if you're looking at that change and that shift in the smaller houses, the split homes, those all come back to, as Scott alluded to, that's a, you know those are the zoning issues. And as Sarah said, that's also the, the NIMBY issue. That's getting used to that it's going to have to look a little different on the outside so that we can continue to grow uh, you know, further in the future. Part, just one more thing. I mean, part of that issue is parking. And I think you know we're all kind of used to cars and that sort of thing. And it's a legitimate issue for you know, a residential neighborhood is you know, how many cars there may be. But I think as, as we sort of transition to a different concept of walkability, particularly in, in towns, and cities um, to divorcing ourselves and our zoning from the, the parking issue is going to be an important dimension of that. And I know that this is something that you know, Petoskey City Council and others are kind of dealing with. And so that's that's something you know that there, there's there's reason behind it, but still I think we just need to have a different concept of of walkability and, and public transit and other kinds of things that can help address those transportation needs without reliance on automobile. So. Yes. Based on the, over the past three or four years, the number of help wanted ads here looks like being much more rental property, especially in the short term. I know all the housing uh, as a five-year plan, that looks pretty good. It looks like things are under uh, control. But the immediate needs to keep the community sustainable I, I would agree with that, and I, and I think the demand study um, echoes that. You know, I, I think I quoted in the statistic is in your handouts, 1,800 units of rental housing needed, um, and that's everything from apartments to you know to duplexes to quadplexes to you know apartment buildings to rental homes, um, all up and down the scale, but. Build density, unfortunately, has become a dirty word, especially in communities like ours, um, because density has connotations that I think are, are not correct, but unfortunately have come along with that word. And so I think that's one of the things that we have to get over, is talking about what does density look like in our communities? Because I agree, we don't need a, a 300 unit apartment building, right? But what we do need is other kinds of density. Um, and that is going to be really hard because of certain restrictions around um, zoning and planning and also around financing. Um, so I mean, I will tell you, in the village of Hillside, which is in Harbor Springs, which is true subsidized senior housing, um, it took me three rounds through the MISHTA program that we ended up using in order to get funded. So it, it added an additional two years on my development cycle because I had to get through, the only way we were going to be able to build it was with federal funds. 
and because we're a rural community, because of the way those projects are scored, we don't make it. <laughs> they are they are weighted not towards rural communities. They are weighted towards um, urban communities. Um, it took us a long time, and we had to do all sorts of funky things in order to be able to get funded. So that's another piece of this puzzle and i know the chamber is very active in the um, coalition that's working on some of those pieces at the state level which is another place that we really need advocacy to address this so it is multi-layered every time there come there, which is why we desperately need a staff person our housing coordinator who wakes up every day and thinks about this and works on it for us you talked about younger all of the other housing issues sit, unfortunately. Um, you know, there are specific funds that are available for senior housing, um, which in these days is defined as 62 and better. Um, but, yes, 60, 62 and better, that's right. Um, but there hasn't been any new money in any of those programs for a very long time. And within the past year, there it sounds like there is some new money coming for those programs, but how it gets parceled out is still a mystery so we will keep you posted the last time they had uh, no notice of funding for that program they um, strongly encouraged you to combine it with the low-income housing tax credit program which in the state of Michigan is only available in urban areas so you know there's Couple of strikes against us there. Exactly. Okay. All right. So the MISHTA that we've been referring to is the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, uh, and it is a channel for a lot of federal funding as well. But they did uh, just agree; it haven't actually happened yet, but just agreed to establish a rural category for its funding in its next round of funding. But the amount of um, resources that are in that is something we can still continue to debate. But I mean, at least they recognize the issue. That. And unfortunately, even in the rural category, we compete against Traverse City, which is considered rural. So there you go. There was a question back over here. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for including us in uh, Bayview in the community. Um, and I mean, you know, coming here, bringing us part of it, and you know, bringing our program into a place like home. Um, I'm a fourth generation person. I've been coming up here my whole life every summer. My kids, when they are asked where they're from, they always say Bayview, Michigan, or Petoskey, Michigan. So this is near and dear to us. I am so pleased that you told us how we can take action. And I encourage all of our Bayview members to, to take action in, in helping this cause because we are part of the community. We've only been coming up here for 146 years. Um, so it's it's near and dear to us. And I, know, I know I don't look that old, but it's, uh, I take collagen, so help me. Um, but just out of curiosity to help me, how many people here today is the first time setting foot on the Bay View? Raise your hand. That's awesome. That's one of our things that we want to make sure that we want to invite people in to participate because we are open to all and we feel part of the community. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good.
and running law enforcement. So are there um, I can get that one. There's actually state legislation. So first, on a state level right now, that was actually in last week, a short-term rental bill. Um, that It's a start, but it's not the right bill necessarily because it takes away a little bit of local control. So what you do want is you do want local control on short-term rentals and how that works because how we see it in Petoskey is going to be very different than how Grand Rapids sees a short-term rental. And you pointed out a really clear point. It's, it's not about personal wealth or business when it's investors that can buy many, many homes at much over the asking price, bidding out somebody who's going to live locally versus somebody who says, you know, we've worked our whole life to sell this home and now we're going to run it because we're going to, you know, move in with, you know, our sister-in-law or whatever. That's a different situation. That's somebody taking advantage of what they have than when you have those investors that are coming in across the country and finding that market. So Petoskey does have short-term rental. How many years ago was that? Maybe four or five years ago in the city limits, some legislation, some, some ordinances were put in to kind of prevent growth on that. Um, but when you put it in local control, and that's kind of as chambers, that's where we want to see this legislation go on a state level, is because we do know that um, if you start putting ordinances underneath it on a state level, that might benefit an urban area, but again, like our Mishta, come against our rural areas that we've got to look at that. So there is a very big awareness, and it is a fine line, because we as a tourism area, we want visitors to come and visit and spend your money. Please do, welcome. We're happy you're here, but we need to be able to serve you. And to do that, we need to be able to live here year round. So it's definitely a very aware <laughs> issue for us. And I got, did I get cut off? No. You're, you're <laughs> we are almost at 3.30. I see them yeah, coming to. Walt's, Walt's getting right. out there, yeah, so. No, I just, um, before, before you speak, let me just thank you again. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions. We'll stay around if anybody has any other questions and things. But thanks, Walt. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks, Babe, you for hosting this. And uh, let's continue the conversation. So, I wanted to give a shout out to our sound man back there, Zach. He was under the new tent location, and I thought the sound was great. Uh, it's a great setting, and so come back to Bayview. Bayview's open to the community. We've got great programs this summer, and again, thanks for coming, and enjoy your day.